As a child, most of the stories I associated with the life of Jesus came to me from Matthew's Gospel. Of course, I didn't know that at the time. I'm sure I never gave much thought to the source of those stories, but I surely enjoyed them. In school, we acted out the visit of the Magi and reacted in horror to the king killing Jewish babies in Bethlehem. We memorized the Beatitudes and we learned all about being salt for the world and turning the other cheek. We learned about the power of faith with stories about mustard seeds and yeast and about the importance of helping people in need and in the process helping Jesus. As it turns out, many of my favorite Bible stories from childhood come from the Gospel of Matthew. What I did not know at an early age and what you and I both know now is that each Gospel has a slightly different flavor. Much of the storyline is the same, of course, but each gospel writer adds his own particular slant as the stories came to be told in the various communities of the early church. So taken together, the four gospels present a multi-dimensional picture of Jesus and his message, his earliest followers, and the various responses to his message. If you approach any one gospel thinking it will give you the definitive picture of Jesus, you will be disappointed. If you approach all four Gospels thinking they are written like modern biographies, you will also be disappointed because there will be gaps in information, some questions about chronology, some confusion about differing accounts. That's because a Gospel is a unique literary genre. The word Gospel comes from the Greek evangelion, meaning good news. A gospel is a proclamation of the good news of Jesus. It proclaims who Jesus is and what Jesus was about during his existence in human history. So yes, we get information about him along the way, but more importantly, we come to know Jesus and are invited into a relationship with him. The evangelists pulled together reflections about the life and ministry of Jesus based on what became most significant in the missionary witness given by his earliest followers. You might think of it this way. If you were to tell your grandchildren or nieces and nephews about the most significant teacher in your life, you couldn't begin to tell every incident, nor would it be necessary. You would select from among the many incidents you recall and tell the stories in a way that illustrated the best things given to you by that teacher. It's much the same process for a gospel writer, but magnified by the significance of the person of Jesus, the impact of his ministry for salvation, and by the community telling of those experiences. It becomes the inspired Word of God because we believe that God is present in the entire process of proclamation, writing, and editing that produce the four Gospels in the pages of our Bibles. Matthew's Gospel is placed first in the New Testament canon, but most scholars do not believe it was the first Gospel composed. However, its frequent quotations of Hebrew scriptures make it a strong bridge between the Old and New Testaments. Additionally, its very clear teachings made it a good starting place for new believers. The Gospel of Matthew follows a storyline that is indeed very close to that found in the Gospels of Mark and Luke. These similarities led to the designation of these three Gospels as the Synoptic Gospels. They share the same vision or the same skeleton, though as mentioned earlier, each exhibits unique features. Matthew's Gospel appears to have been written between 80 and 90, certainly sometime after the fall of Jerusalem, which occurred in the year 70. Mark's Gospel is the only one whose historical allusions predate the fall of Jerusalem in 70, leading the majority of scholars to believe that his Gospel provides the basic framework for all three of the Synoptic Gospels. 
In addition to the material garnered from Mark's gospel, it appears that both Matthew and Luke share some common material not found in Mark, material that is referred to by scholars as the Q source. And finally, there is material in Matthew's gospel that is unique to Matthew's gospel, unique because of his own community's needs and his unique theological perspective. Matthew was a fairly common name at the time of the writing of this gospel, and we are unsure as to which Matthew might have been its author. Traditionally, we associate the author with Matthew the tax collector, one of the 12 apostles. But the late date of the writing, as well as the Greek rather than Aramaic text, leads scholars to believe it would not have been the apostle himself, though the apostle might have had a connection with the community that gave rise to this gospel. Most scholars do agree, however, that the author was likely a Jewish Christian, evidenced by his familiarity with and frequent references to Jewish feasts, rituals, and scripture. There's also some consensus that the community Matthew addresses was a mixed Jewish and Gentile community that may have been located in Antioch, Syria. Now, all of this information is important as we begin to read the gospel and try to understand how the gospel texts may have been heard and understood in their original setting. But we do not study a gospel merely out of historical curiosity and appreciation for the past. We study and pray with any gospel because it is the living word of God. And it continues to speak to us even in the 21st century. In particular, it is the living word because it calls us into relationship with Jesus himself. The Jesus that Matthew and his community came to know was very much at home in the Jewish world. He knew the role of the law as a sign of the covenant God made with Israel and with the world. He knew the hopes and expectations for God's Savior, the Messiah. Jesus no doubt understood the role of the rabbi as a teacher of the community because he himself became a very effective teacher, one who was constantly forming his disciples through his words, his deeds, his very presence with them. Matthew's gospel is marked by five large units of material which contain important teachings. These five discourses are each introduced by a narrative of events. The first teaching discourse is perhaps the best known. It's the Sermon on the Mount, which is found in chapters five through seven and contains a collection of sayings and teachings that reveal the upside down nature of the kingdom of heaven that Jesus proclaims. The second discourse is found in chapter 10. It focuses on the nature and cost of discipleship and is preceded by a narrative of the healing works of Jesus. And then following a series of events and teachings highlighting opposition to Jesus, the third discourse appears in chapter 13 as a series of parables on the kingdom. Some of the best love stories of Jesus and his interaction with people are found in the chapters that precede the fourth discourse, which is found in chapter 18. This discourse deals with the interaction of those called to be in community together, the attitudes and behaviors that are appropriate for community life. Now the final discourse is situated between several chapters having to do with authority and then the final chapters of the gospel which powerfully demonstrate the authority of Jesus in his death and resurrection. The discourse itself is found in chapters 24 and 25 and is known as the apocalyptic or eschatological discourse. This last discourse is meant to help Christians live in uncertain times, awaiting the coming of Christ with hope and an attitude of readiness. The Gospel of Matthew is the only one of the four to use the term ecclesia, the Greek word for church, which literally means the assembly of those called out. As church, we are called out from the worldly values that dominate the horizon of our thinking. But we're also called out to something. We're called out to embrace a kingdom that is not of this world, but must be lived in the world in which we find ourselves. In other words, in a world dominated by consumerism, the church is called to live in simplicity and generosity. In a world that's dominated by revenge, the church is called instead to live and to stand for justice and mercy. 
In a world dominated by images of power, the church is called to be servant. Because the church is a prominent concern in the Gospel of Matthew, it is safe to assume that relationships in that community are of paramount importance. A simple parable such as the Good Shepherd who searches for the lost sheep is a reminder that leadership must be about care and service of others, especially care for those who are on the fringes. Instructions that promote turning the other cheek and praying for enemies remind us that while conflict is a normal part of community, conflict resolution must take the shape of compassion and forgiveness. Throughout the Gospel of Matthew, there are many titles for Jesus. In the first verse, you'll notice that he is called Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. He is a man of his own people. He is also called Jesus, a name meaning Yahweh saves, giving us some ideas about his mission and his relationship to God. He is called Emmanuel because he is indeed God with us in his own time in history and in the resurrection. He is called a king and the Messiah, reminding us that he is a new kind of ruler and is anointed by God. Even the titles for Jesus let us know that Matthew is concerned to tell the story of the Messiah in a way that stresses his significance as Redeemer. In every instance, I think you will notice that Jesus is consistently a man of the people. He interacts with his environment and with all kinds of characters in every scene. Relationships have the power to reveal so much about us. The people with whom we form friendships indicate an awful lot about our values, our likes and dislikes, even our goals. The ways we respond to people on a daily basis reveals something about our personalities and our desires. So in some ways, Jesus is just like us in that his relationships tell us something about him. His relationship to God in prayer, his relationship to people in need, his relationship to his closest followers, all these relationships give us insight into the person of Jesus. Now Matthew tends to use certain classes of characters to reveal the person and mission of Jesus. William Thompson in his brief book about this gospel speaks of different kinds of characters who fulfill certain roles in the way that Matthew tells the story of Jesus. According to Thompson, there are six groupings of characters who interact with Jesus. The first three groups respond to Jesus positively, and they include what Thompson calls the followers, the supplicants, and the crowds. Now the followers are characterized by curiosity and by openness. Jesus is often shown with them in a teaching posture, inviting them into a deeper and deeper relationship with him as he reveals more and more of the kingdom. The supplicants are those who seek Jesus out, usually aware of their need for healing or forgiveness. And they model faith by taking the necessary steps to be healed. Jesus usually tells them that their faith has made them whole. And after they have encountered Jesus, they usually disappear from the story. The crowds are those who respond to Jesus and end up following him to Jerusalem. They usually exhibit awe or wonder or amazement, but do not necessarily exhibit long-term commitment. In fact, in Matthew's gospel, some of them end up siding with his enemies in the end, swayed by the force of others' opinions. In addition to the groups just named, Thompson also recognizes that there are others who play important roles in progressing the story of Jesus in Matthew's gospel. So for example, another group is the Jewish religious authorities, and they are almost always hostile to Jesus and his message. This group would include the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the chief priests and elders. Now it is important to note that at the time the gospel was written, there was much greater animosity between the church and the synagogue than there would have been between Jesus and Judaism. However, for Matthew, the Jewish religious authorities become symbolic of the forces opposed to God's power in the world. Another group that appears in the gospel is composed of Roman authorities, people like Pilate, the Roman procurator, even the soldiers who arrest and crucify Jesus have a very limited role, meaning we do not know much about them, nor are they presented as very complex characters. 
Their appearance mainly keeps the story progressing. And finally, Matthew refers to the nations, meaning those Jews and Gentiles who either receive or reject the disciples of Jesus. As we read, study, and pray with the Gospel of Matthew over the next weeks, we might ask ourselves what group we might feel comfortable with. Are we like those who come to Jesus with expectant faith for healing? Or are we still in the initial stages of enthusiasm, not quite ready to make a full commitment? Are we coming to Jesus with our entire lives? Or are we like the Roman authorities who show only one part of themselves and only for the sake of moving the story along? Are we disciples, willing to be taught by Jesus, willing to become part of the assembly of those called out? Each time we read the gospel, whether it is a section that is overly familiar or a section we've never noticed, we have the opportunity to respond, to be shaped by the demands of the gospel, to be drawn into the spirit of this gospel and into the spirit of Jesus as Matthew and his community came to know it. Ronald Witherup is the author of a commentary on Matthew that focuses on its spirituality. In his book, he identifies the overarching themes of Christology, which means one's understanding of Christ, and ecclesiology, which is one's understanding of the church. And he says that those two things dominate Matthew's writing about Jesus. Witherup also includes a list of 12 related themes that can be found woven together in this gospel. So briefly, I'd like to review those themes as you begin this study. So first, be on the lookout for the ways that Jesus is the fulfillment of God's plan told through the prophets. Then pay attention to the loving relationship Jesus shares with his heavenly Father, the most common designation for God in this gospel. The title Emmanuel is introduced early, but the reality of God's presence in the humanity of Jesus is powerful throughout the gospel. Look for the ways that Jesus uses both word and deed to offer healing and salvation as the Messiah. Matthew's gospel has a universal appeal, opening the way for both Jews and Gentiles. Disciples of Jesus are called to be righteous or called to live ethically in a profound way in this gospel. Final judgment is a theme that is more prominent in Matthew than in the other Gospels, a judgment based very much on ethical living. The call to discipleship will involve difficulty but is a share in the ministry of Jesus. Faith involves doubt and questioning but is most threatened by fear. Conversion requires a sense of one's sinfulness as well as accepting and offering forgiveness. Discipleship naturally leads to evangelization. The world is in need of the good news. Finally, Witherup identifies the theme of prayer that is simple, regular, humble, and heartfelt. Pay close attention to the teachings about prayer, but also to the examples of prayer that are scattered throughout the gospel. There is, of course, the prayer that Jesus taught his followers and that we recite with great regularity. It has a simplicity and honesty that is the heart of prayer. But look, too, at the ways in which people approach Jesus for healing in the gospel. They speak his name, and it becomes prayer. He asks what they want, and they state it simply and directly. They receive his healing touch and go away praising God. Reverence for the name of Jesus, expectation of his touch, articulation of our needs, and praise because we have encountered Jesus these are the ways we pray as we enter into this study. I want to encourage you to study daily, to make your study time a time of expectation and reverence. You can create a habit of daily time in prayer with God's Word that will open you to new and deeper experiences of Jesus. And then your small group time will become a more profound experience of being church together, called out by God to proclaim the kingdom in word and in deed.